Uh oh, it looks like we piqued your interest in the hideout. First of all, let me tell you what the hideout is not. The hideout is not for hustlers, for grinders, or for people who are looking for a shortcut to what the world calls success. The hideout is about growing as men, creating lifelong friendships, and having the time of our lives. Are you ready to tap in to the endless source that will take you from success to significance? The hideout is two and a half days of hiking, biking, and doing the little things that it takes to create lifelong friendships. I find that joy is nothing more than falling in love with your current circumstances and allowing magic to happen. And that's when we see growth in every area of your life. Have you accomplished your goals professionally and financially and you still thirst for something more? Has success in these areas come at the expense of far more valuable things like your family, your children, and your relationships? Alignment in business strategic partnerships, and joint ventures all come from true relationships. The Hideout is designed to get to know people before you'll ever need them. This is not your typical mastermind. The Hideout is focused on the one thing that will fuel everything, joy. And when joy is overflowing in your life, you'll find growth in your marriage, your relationships, and oh yeah, your business. Welcome to the Kelly Cardenas Podcast, where attitude is everything on today's show. I've been go- coming after this guy for quite some time. Actually, it's been almost two years that we had the podcast going, 200 episodes, and I've been asking and asking and asking, and I finally got the title right. I put up their S, but he told me it's F, so FVP of Axos Bank, uh, and it's National Sales Director, am I correct on this? Did I say it right? Hundred percent correct. I said it correct, but also what I want you to know about this man is, I mean, he he mentors, so he takes time to be able to make sure that other people don't have to go through the same challenges that he has. He's got two best-selling books. This guy is an absolute phenomenon um, and just an incredible person. I get a chance to spend time with him about every three, four weeks, and I, and I just glean so much amazing information, and not only the information but the heart of who this man is. He takes his time, uh, his free time, and goes down and plays music to be able to minister to people that otherwise wouldn't be able to have church, and maybe sometimes they wouldn't be in a building, but he goes down and does that. He implements those type of practices, and there's no question why every single thing he touches continues to grow and grow at a high level. So please welcome to the show, Mr. Jay Shoup. Thank you kindly. That's 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 quite the uh, um, edification. I certainly appreciate it. <laughs> well, Jay, unnecessary, but appreciated. No, it's it's necessary, man. Because you know, we we met. I remember uh, you know connecting through the salon years ago, and you had dropped off a book for me. And um, I want to talk about uh, a couple of them. I know the the first one, the fifty two. Uh, um, tell me, tell me again. 52 maxims. That's the second one. The first one is the death of mediocrity. Yes, the death of mediocrity. And I remember you dropping off the book and, and it's just, it's amazing because you're constantly wanting to build other people up and, and in the type of position that you're at and the level that you're at in your business and in your life, this is not really something that you have to do. It's something that you want to do. Why is this so important? Well, I think you raise a great question there. Why is it important? You know, the, Part of our upbringing and our and our teaching and as being students of the game, right? I talk all, a lot about uh, my mentor's reminder of remaining a student and not a follower. Is that we have real world uh, experiences and skills and talents and opportunities that we've had the great fortune to experience in our life, and we're not supposed to keep that stuff locked in the closet, right? We're supposed to share it with others and. And who knows if even maybe as a result of this conversation, uh, somebody that's going through some hard stuff or somebody that's not quite sure how things are looking for them can be, uh, uh, let's say, uh, encouraged to uh, stay, co- stay the course and surround yourself with people that uh, love and support and care for you. And then, you know, you get to be that person for somebody else. I, that's what it's all about as far as I can tell. 
Do you agree? Well, well, I, I do agree, but it, it's not natural. You know, that's why mm. I, that's why I've been so, uh, so attracted to a friendship with you. And I, I look forward to our time where we get to sit and, and literally all I do is ask you questions because you are a wealth of knowledge and you're willing to give it. And I think a lot of times people out there are like, well, how can I find a mentor? How can I find a, yeah, I mean, uh, mm. the, to have an FB, a VP of, of a, a major, major bank in this country to be able to, to answer questions, you're a complete open book. And I've watched you like this with every single person that you come in contact with. It's not like you're yeah. hoarding the information. Like, how can a person find a mentor and how could a person find a mentor at your level? Well, I think the first piece, you know, I'm, I'm careful with that word mentor, you know, mentor and coach, you know, my original, um, my original website, coachshoop.com has coach built into it. And that was just a freak thing where somebody said, man, you know, would you coach me on this thing? I'm like, okay, you know, Hey, coach shoop. And then it kind of stuck. But I, I like to think of my brand of mentorship as giving options instead of advice. Now our mutual friend, Greg Reed, right. Talks about, you know, seeking wise counsel and not opinions. It goes along those same things, right? It's like, uh, listen, I don't know it all. I don't have it figured out. I'm literally figuring it out right along with you. And there are, there are things that I do have a little bit more figured out just based upon making poor choices and bad decisions over the course of my lifetime. And, and um, you know, I, it's my opinion that accessibility is a responsibility, not a privilege. So I remain accessible for that exact reason. And I wish I would have had somebody like you or like me in my ear uh, during my knucklehead days of my youth to about 30. And, uh, you know, now I've got a couple of decades beyond that to, to be able to not just evaluate this information, but apply it into my life. And that's my encouragement to anybody seeking a mentor is if a, if a mentor or a coach or somebody says, hey, uh, I've done this thing, this was the result. And if you go do this thing, you're likely to get a similar result. And then you're tasked with applying that result you know, go do it, you know, go do it, test it for yourself. You know, don't do it because I said it's a great idea, you know, do it because you're willing to find out for yourself if it's a good idea. You know, in 52 Maxims, I say, you know, make sure that your decisions are a product of your own conclusions, right? Don't just make decisions based upon, hey, this guy says it's a great idea. This guy says buy Bitcoin at 70 grand. This guy said, you know, I mean, how do those things work out? You have to test them for yourself. Well, I think one of the coolest things with you, too, is the humility aspect of it. When we talk about finances, which I want to get into because I want to get into uh, the yeah, I, you you've told me about, I believe it's the law of is it the law of seven or the law of 12? The, the, the rule of 72. So, 72. It's that well, there was two numbers in there that were good. But before we get into that, the, the humility part of it, anytime I ask you about the financial part, which you're an absolute genius at, and you're, I mean, you're going to be humble and be like, no, I'm just a guy. No, I mean, you're one of the top in your business. And the growth of your business has been tremendous, especially since you started to move into the realms where you are. But yeah. you constantly direct my eyes to all of the mistakes that you made. And you're like, well, I made all these mistakes. Therefore, I make this particular decision. Where does that mm -hmm. humility come? Because most of the time, when you, I lived in Vegas forever, Jay. And nobody yeah. wants to talk about what they lost. They want to talk about what they want. <laughs> and you're completely opposite. That's why I think that, that yeah. so many people are attracted to you. I appreciate that. Well, well yeah, the... Uh, you know, I've said before that I wasn't equipped, uh, kind of like a lottery winner. I wasn't equipped to manage my first million when I made it. And I think a lot of times, you know, people, people look at, at success and they see it as a dollar sign, you know, over the course of my life, uh, I've been humbled and, and we can debate what the source of that humbling was, uh, whether it was corrective or, or some other, uh, outside influence, but. I saw once this t-shirt, I actually have one now. I was considering wearing it for you, uh, but uh, you know, you told me to look good. So I'm hoping that the collar does it for you, uh, <laughs> but it says, but it says stay humble or be humbled. Ooh. And I kind of keep that in the back of my mind when I'm uh, considering talking about how great I am at this thing or the other thing or whatever. Yes, I have experience, 
yes, I have skills. Yes, I have talents. But I view those all as great gifts from God, our creator. And uh, I'm doing my best to uh, honor that relationship and then also share, um, you know, the, the real simple commandments, right? Love God and love people as you love yourself. If you, if you get those two right, most everything else is going to, it may not work out every time in your favor, but the odds are significantly higher that you're going to have success that you can directly attribute to those philosophies. So Jay, let's talk about not being ready for that first million, because I think a lot, I think, I think a lot of us, right. It's like, we hope for, or we dream, or we have these, you know, especially today, like everyone is like, make a goal, then make a plan and then just charge at it. But they don't tell us to get ready for when the goal comes. And a lot of, (laughs) a lot of us, and we've talked about this, a lot of us have been punched in the mouth Mm -hmm. by the thing that we wanted the most. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Well, it's not. Why do we even? Well, if I why mean, do we I'm, even? Do, why do we even do it? <laughs> I'm telling you, Jay. Why. Like, if they they tell, like they told me, like, okay, if you if you make X amount of money, you know, that's that's what you focus on, and you go towards the goal. And then I remember yeah. doing and and getting to that point, and then realizing, wow, there's a lot of things that I wish that I would have sat down and realized when you before you made your first million what yeah. what you what would you have wished that someone would have sat down and said like jay when this comes let's get you prepared what would have been that preparation oh it's my gosh it's it's almost it's so simple and so fundamental that i'm almost embarrassed saying it but <laughs> when it comes to when it comes to fundamentals you know that that's that's what i build my life and my um mentorship around is these fundamental elements. And if somebody would have said, Hey, Jay, you're going to be making some money. Okay. You're fortunate. You're blessed. You live in America. When you get that money, here's the key. Spend less than what you make. (laughs) I wish they would have told me spend less than what you make. Right. So at the peak of this thing, you know, to dial it back to 2006 and having a monthly nut of roughly 40 grand, you know, houses, cars, uh, you name it, over leveraged, and then the plug gets pulled, right? It doesn't take too many months in a row of making zero and having a liability of 40 grand monthly for things to go uh, against you, if you will, right? That's not sustainable. I mean, I, I don't want to say it too lightly, but a lot of people didn't make it through that season either by choice or by circumstance. Mm. And that's, that's real world pain. Those are real losses. That's heavy water, you know? And, and if you're going through something like that, you loving listener, um, I feel you. I know what that's like. (laughs) Well, when I'm laughing, when I'm laughing too, Jay, I'm not laughing. And you know, and I know from our relationship and our friendship, I am not laughing at Jay as he's saying that he lost this amount of money. I'm laughing because both of us talk about this all the time, how we both got smacked in the mouth during this time. Some of the people out there, when you said $40,000 net, okay, like you go through it and you have financial terms and and things like that. Can you explain to us... (laughs) what that means. And then you broke it down to me the other day where you were like, you know, you did the multiple, uh, the, the, the multiplication fast. You were like, well, 40 yeah. happens and then yeah. bang, bang, bang. So break this down yeah. because I want our listeners to understand it. Well, I was just, you know, in that conversation, I was saying is I thought I had reserves. Like, like when the mortgage crisis first started, I thought it was a speed bump, right? Like, okay, things are rough. A couple months from now, everything's going to be fine. So I'm just going to use my reserves to subsidize my lack of income and keep the creditors happy. Like that was my game plan at that time. Uh, it sounds noble, but it really was all about self-preservation and, and really ignorance of how severe the magnitude of that circumstance or situation was. So I said, okay, you know, I've got a couple hundred grand in my retirement account. I'll just start liquidating that. And I'll use that to fund my lifestyle uh, as opposed to uh, making the corrections that were necessary at that time. And so 
yeah, I said, look, it doesn't, it doesn't take very long. You can do the math. You know, in this case, if I do 40 grand a month and I divide it into 200,000, somebody really quickly is going to say that's somewhere between, you know, five months and, and maybe a little bit more, depending on if you took penalties on the withdrawals from your IRA or not, or if you were borrowing cash or, you know, extracting cash or whatever. So, you know, in that circumstance, that season lasted for, uh, from July 31st of 2007 until I tapped out in uh, October of 2009. Wow. So that was talk, a long run. Jay, talk to me, uh, hit him with the uh, rule of 72 because uh, we alluded to oh. it. I, I said seven and then I said 12, <laughs> but you knew what I was talking about. Yeah, the rule of 72, it, it really blew my brains when you talked about this because this was normal and natural to you. Whereas for mm -hmm. me, as, as, a, as a person that wasn't in the financial world, it, yeah. it, it helped to simplify things. Can you break this down for us? I will, absolutely. And, and let me say that I'm not a mathematician. Like if, if you would have found me in, uh, in high school in any math class, it would have been with my head down, drooling on my desk asleep until the teacher came and slapped me on the back of the head. <laughs> and it's like, I needed somebody to explain these things. They're complex into a simple way that I could understand. And that's, thankfully, I've been able to adopt that into my approach in, in the way that I try to teach. So the rule of 72 just says, you know, using uh, the, the philosophy of compounding is that if you divide your rate of return into 72, then that will tell you the number of years that it will take in order for an investment to double. So for example, if you said I'm making 6% return on my money, then 12 years from now, that thing year over year should be double in its value. If I paid a million for it today and I got a 6% year over year return, 12 years from now, it's going to be worth 2 million. And so what that allows us to do over time is recognize the value of compounding because nobody teaches us this stuff when we're young enough for it to make a difference, right? So you and I, um, let's see, have you had your 50th birthday yet? Not yet. It's coming. Okay. So, so for me, the odds are high. I'm kind of on the bubble right now, but the number of years behind me is greater than the number of years in front of me. Now, I expect to get to 120. I've got a goal of my daughter taking me to Disneyland on my 100th birthday and going on the Matterhorn. Hopefully it's not in an urn, but you know, I've got gold. So if you think about how many more doubles do I have in my lifetime, not that many. Mm. Not that many. If I was getting 6% return on a thing right now, and let's just say that I hit my goal, so I got 50 years ahead of me, then if I know that something's going to double every 12 years, I've got four doubles left in my lifetime based upon that math. Now go back and meet me when I was 20 and smack me around and say, hey, knucklehead, let's put this money here instead of you trying to go finance that 1987 Chevy Camaro beer bottle brown with the inky knockoffs and gold rims. Instead of doing that, let's just put that money aside and let compounding work for you. And then 40 years from now, after that puppy is doubled and you know, your original thousand dollars is now, I mean, I don't know if you do the math, somebody do 12 doubles on a thousand dollars and you will be shocked. It's not $12,000. And we'd be having an entirely different conversation about, uh, my past between 2006, seven and nine. So how can a person, especially in today's society where, you know, and we've talked about this before, where we're hearing about Bitcoin, we're hearing about different investments, we're hearing about these things and people are like, I'm not trying to get a 6% return. That sounds meager. Let me go get this 50%. Let me go get this 15%. Let me go get, th how can you help a person to be able to reel back when all you see is shiny stuff right now? Listen, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to give anybody advice or counsel when it comes to whether they should dial it back or not. What I'm going to do instead for me is I'm going to let you be you and I'm going to let me be me and I'm going to love you. And I hope you love me and we'll let the chips fall where they may. Now, if you say, I'm thinking about doing this thing and I know you have experience with that thing share your experience with me 
I'll do that all day long. But I would not say, hey, Kelly, I'm not so sure that this Bitcoin at 70K is the right thing for you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, actually, for you, I might have said it. But, you know, and I work for a bank and, you know, crypto is part of the conversation, you know, that's, you know, that's a big piece of the action. But, you know, I think that we're, um, sadly, th this is my own personal assessment, sadly, way more interested in kind of get rich quick. Um, you know, I, I think, I don't know if it's, Mac, I think it's maxim number six in, in 52 maxims that says forget rich and famous, instead pursue effective and ethical. And that's kind of my approach, right? No, no more, no more quest for rich and famous. Uh, I, I'm uh, blessed to, to have uh, a great role, great income. Uh, I've worked for it. You know, I was part of the puzzle, right? It's not just somebody uh, sprinkling fairy dust on me and dropping me off in Magic Candy Rainbow Island and all of a sudden my life is awesome. That's not it, right? There is work. We are required to do the work. And I, I have, you know, thankfully. And, and I've been blessed in that. And, you know, that's, I see it as my responsibility to share those things with others when given the opportunity. Well, Jay, talk to me too about the recovery part, because a lot of people don't talk about the recovery, right? They, yeah. you know, and I'm not yeah. talking about recovery from alcohol or drugs or whatever it is, but when you yeah. go through a challenge like you did during that, that yeah. drop off, and if, if you were alive, you know, some of our listeners, yeah. you know, are in that, in that 20 to 30 realm. So they don't really remember the impact that that 2008, 2009 had. But those yeah. of our listeners that are above 35, 40, uh, into our 50s and 60s, which we want to thank you all for listening, um, you understand that. But can you talk to us about the recovery and, and, and the confidence level that it takes to be able to go in the grace that you have to have with yourself? Yeah, well, you said it right there. Grace with self is really a key component. Uh, let's, let's park that on the sideline for a second because uh, I've got some thoughts about self-acceptance that are relevant to this conversation. But candidly, I'm still in recovery mode. So when you take the type of losses that I took at that time, you know, it's not the next day where, you know, like I said, it's just all of a sudden everything's rosy and, and uh, we're, we're back on track. It's a lot of work, not just uh, mental work, but spiritual work, working on self and understanding the way that things work and then really understanding the power of thought. You know, we talk about, uh, you know, your thoughts create uh, they're, they're a cause and they create an effect. What nobody talks about is that that new effect becomes a cause for the next effect and so on and so on and so on and so on. And when you're down and when you're beaten and crushed, you know, when your spirit, you know, biblically it says, you know, anybody can stand the physical beating, but who can withstand a crushed spirit, right? When I'm thinking about that time and I'm kind of like, oh, you know, um, when you're at that low, how do you recover? So the first part for me was just realizing, hey, I'm still here. I'm still in the fight. You know, my mentor, uh, Les Brown, would say, hey, just stay in the fight. You never know. You might get that one lucky lick in that turns the thing around for you, right? And so that's, that's really the first part for me. It was just staying in the game and realizing that even though I lost all of these material possessions, my my health is there, my skills, talents, and abilities, those things are not gone. So let's work with what's still there. Everything else got scorched to the earth, but out of these ashes, those things still existed. So let's work with what we've got. And then really it's about, there's a certain element of patience, you know? Um, I think again, in this kind of get rich quick scheme and life, lifestyle that we live in and instant gratification and everything now, you know, we get, we get tricked almost um, into, into being a sheep, right? You know, don't, don't, don't be a sheep, you know, unless, unless you're a black sheep, you know, those black sheep are cool, <laughs> but don't, don't, don't be a, don't be a sheep, you know, be it again, be a, a student, not a follower, be a product of your own conclusions, and then allow yourself the opportunity to um, learn from that experience. Right. That's where it took me a long time. Most people probably would have recovered significantly longer than me. I got to tell you, I was so stoked, you know, at, at that 
at that point in time, I think I might've had a FICO score, if it even registered one, was maybe in the four or 500 range, if I was fortunate and lucky. And I just got that puppy back to 766. So a uh, hot single Christian ladies, if you're looking for a good single guy with a high FICO, I'm your dude. <laughs> there we go. There we go. But again, I, I think that people hear that that humility in you. And Jay, another thing too is, you know, we're both in the in you know around and in the personal development world. Right. And yeah. I've been in it since I was a kid and you know, been around it with my dad. And I've seen the I've seen the ugly side. I've seen the positive side. How, how are you able to stay so rooted and grounded? Like every time that I talk to you about a method, and this has been for years, every time yeah. I talk to you about a method, you always give me a principle in return. Mm -hmm. So, and you always are so focused like on the principle that the method, the methods are going to change. This is what I keep hearing from you yeah. all the time when we have conversations. How can a yeah. person keep that in perspective when all the world wants to give you right now is methods. If you wake up at 5 yeah. a.m., you will be successful. If you take an ice bath, you will be successful. And what I'm hearing from you all the time is, yeah, those things are good, but your heart has to be in the right place. Yeah, here, here's my take on those things, right? Which they may be good. They may be producing the desired effect. They may actually get you closer to your goal. Um, you know, you and I haven't gone down the rabbit hole of quantum theory anytime recently, but if you're of the opinion that it's possible that the past, the present, and the future are all happening at the same time, and we're just the cog in the matrix, like if that's really a thing, then what effect are my actions having on that piece? So when you say, you know, somebody comes to me and goes, hey, do these six steps and you'll be this, or, you know, it's like, okay, let's, let's unwind that a little bit. What is not just what's the proof, but is that particular thing going to work for me? You know, you and I have had uh, philosophical conversations that relate to uh, all personal development principles, ultimately dialing back to our favorite book. And I believe that to be true. This concept of mastermind, right? This mastermind principle. Well, where did that come from? You know, you know, Jesus said, if any two believers come together and agree on a thing, I'm there with you. Right. So they're in a spirit of harmony. Napoleon Hill said, uh, if two people come together in a spirit of harmony and cooperation, then it's like a third mind is there. They called that the mastermind. Right. It's a mastermind. You know, and um, so I love them. I've been a part of many masterminds. I think they're amazing as long as you recognize the source of the info and also you recognize that it requires harmony and cooperation. If those things are absent you can expect your mastermind to go. <laughs> so Jay, uh, another thing too, uh, what I love is um, you seem to have a very humble thought process of some of the things that are on the horizon that a lot of people aren't looking at right now, because we have mm -hmm. been in a, in a 13 year party um, yeah. financially. Right. We've been yeah, in a, yeah. I can't lose. Like I could throw anything against the wall right now and it sticks. I can say, I mean, my, my house increases, you know, a hundred percent in 12 months. And I'm just like, I'm, and this is going to last forever. Can you speak, can you speak to that from your experience now from a judgment standpoint, but can you speak to that? Because sure. I think that that's very important. Yeah. Well, I, I can, I can attest to not being the right guy to pick the top, uh, I can tell you a lot what the bottom looks like <laughs> a lot. I've seen it. I've seen the bottom from my back. So I know what that looks like. Um, but, but yeah, you know, we get, again, I think we get tricked, um, not just media and peers and um, our desire to want to be like that guy. You know, we get tricked into this party's never going to end. Right. And you and I both know every story has a, beginning a middle and an end every story there is no story that just keeps going and going and going with no end and that's the way that i see circumstances like this you know my mentor said the trees aren't going to grow to the sky what does that mean it means that at some point there is a limit to how far a thing can grow i mean beautifully in nature you know it replenishes itself you know when we talk about you know everything in us as human beings, if we would align more with nature and 
how it actually operates and then align our thoughts and actions in relationship to that, we will understand, okay, wait a second, yeah, trees don't grow all the way to the sky. How am I going to protect myself um, or position myself? Sometimes you can't protect yourself you know, as hard as you try. You could put on a helmet and a big padded suit and you know, r run out into traffic that may be sufficient protection, but the bus probably doesn't care what you're wearing, right? Sometimes it's just coming. And knowing that, th this is where the power comes in, in my opinion. Uh, the power comes from knowing that this season is going to end. Like my mentor, Jim Rohn said, you know, this, a, a winter is coming. Winter follows, what does it follow? It follows fall. Spring, summer, fall, winter. Yeah. So, there is a winter coming. So how are you preparing yourself for that winter? That would be the question. You know, we talk a lot about fundamentals and planning. You know, there's really not much to us. You and me, uh, when I'm talking about our physical existence, not, not our indestructible spirit that who knows the extent of it, but as far as keeping the meat suit going, it's really simple. It's eating, sleeping, breathing, and drinking. Well, I bet if you asked the lion's share of the listeners or anybody on the planet, hey, tell me about your eating plan. Okay, maybe you got a meal planner. Tell me about your drinking plan, your sleeping plan. Like nobody's thinking about those things, but they're the most fundamental, critical things that keep us on the planet. Wow. Figure it out, test it. So, Jay, I want to go into uh, like, there's very few people. I mean, number one, you're, again, anyone who is listening to you understands why. I, I want to be your friend. They already know that now. <clears throat> There's very few people like you that can. Won't you be my friend? <laughs> well, that that can create that can create people and and help them to be able to be better. So now you're leading yeah. a team, and in mm -hmm. leading that team, you've got to see some amazing, amazing. And you're again, you're humble, so I get to brag on you. Mm. You've seen some amazing growth, but when I've asked you about like what would you say would be the the key factors of the growth you constantly go to communication yeah. but i want you to yeah i want you what, to expand what, on what this. steps did i take <laughs> what what six steps did i take to success no that's what okay. that, and and i i keep trying to get you to be like you know and whenever we're having a conversation i keep trying to be like i'm gonna get jay today because i'm gonna ask him yeah. and then he's gonna go into method and you never go into method but can you yeah. talk to about uh you okay. know about building a team and when a bottom line is important, it's very, very important in your business. It's, it's oh, yeah. important that way, but you're still doing it from a principal set. How are you able to do that? Okay, so, so I don't want to understate the value of metrics and goals. You know, I work in a merit, meritocracy. That's a, that's a sexy word if you want to Google it later. And we're paid based upon our performance. So yes, the bottom line does matter. And our goals are um, ridiculously uh, high. <laughs> I mean, ridiculously. Like like that old saying of you know shoot shoot for the if you're if you're going for the moon shoot for the stars or you might just hit the moon whatever that whatever that quote is you know we've got astronomical goals right and and I'm and I'm praying that we will uh, have what it takes to hit them. But when it comes to this uh, the steps in growing this team. A really important aspect is I talked about harmony, you know, and coordination in this mastermind principle, right? You got to have people that not just share in the vision, but that have that, you know, it's it's maybe an overused cliche of heart centered, right? But there's some there's some real world, you know, uh, truth to that. You know, we can we could trace it back to biblically, uh, you know, the the statement that everything flows from the heart, right? So if that's true, then it's really important to have somebody that agrees on uh, what it means to be a part of this team. And it, it would, I don't know if it would shock you. It may, sh it may be surprising to find that all uh, races, backgrounds, religions, colors, um, uh, pronouns, whatever you have it, are all a part of the team. The heart's in the right place. You know, if you're starting with that, you could go back to your six indicators. You know, if you if you start there, you know, again, is everything going to work out awesome? I don't know. Are the odds higher? Significantly. 
So what do you say to the person that uh, says to, and I hear this all the time when, when I hear about yeah. serv- servant leadership, right? <clears throat> I hear about servant leadership and then I hear there's, there's two sides. One is like, yes, that's the way of the future. And then I hear the other side of like, that's soft. I ain't trying to, yeah. can you talk to that a little bit and help people to understand what servant leadership truly is? Because you're a servant leader, <laughs> but you're hard charging and you hit goals and you, you hit metrics and you raise the bottom line. Well, and, and I'm not going to say I have a mean streak, but I don't have a lot of tolerance for things that are uh, off the rails or ineffective, you know? So that's, that's a part where, uh, again, we'll get back to self-acceptance, but this is a part where self-assessment is required. Like, how do I fit into that role? And again, you know, I keep, uh, I, I sound like I'm a preacher, something a Bible, but I just think about the lion and the lamb. And when I think lion and lamb, I think that my teacher who I want to be more like um, had the ability to cut to the core when it came to being direct, but always, always from a place of love. And so that's the constant reminder for me. And that's, that's my personal challenge is, um, you know, I can be curt with my team, with our customers. And sometimes I got to look at myself and go, Hey bro, you need to soften that a little bit, right? The way that you delivered that could be perceived or received as something less than loving, which you so claim to be. So let's make sure it's appropriate. And then as far as being soft, you know, I I heard uh, Seth Godin plug these two words together one time. It was confident vulnerability. And I thought, you know what? I want to embody that. That sounds like something I could uh, connect with confident vulnerability you know uh earlier when i was talking about losing everything and my spirit being crushed you know i'm starting to get misty and i'm not hey kelly turn this thing off and 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 cut 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 this out and make sure nobody sees it right it's like i don't really care you know (laughs) i mean i care i love you i care but i'm not allowing it to affect what i believe is um sharing a valuable component of how you can move forward if you're going through a season like that Talk to the leaders out there that when they do get crushed, because a lot of times when your spirit gets crushed, your confidence is low, you're going through these things. A lot of times it's very easy to make decisions that will be a quick fix that will make you feel better. But in the long haul, it will take your character. And Oh my gosh. (laughs) Can you speak to that a little bit? I can, you know, there's, there's a great book. You know, we, we mentioned this personal development, um, uh, what I call the vortex that we live in in San Diego County and, we're, and we are a part of, which is great. Um, but uh, when Greg Reed wrote Three Feet from Gold and he had a celebration and he had a bunch of speakers there and he had a guy, um, I'm not recalling his last name right now, but um, he, was, um, he was from the Hershey's Kisses Company, uh, the chocolate makers, right? Mm-hmm. And, and one of his nuggets in that book was, never make a life-changing decision when you're in a valley. And I think that we, we tend to do that, right? We're, we're built for achievement, you and me. Like we're cut from the same cloth in some fashion. Now, I, I'm not growing dreadlocks anytime soon, but you can bet that the part of us that's non-physical is literally, we're like this, right? You can't separate us. And so if you've got an achievement-driven mindset and you believe that you are living at the intersection of your your skills and your purpose and your talents and your opportunities and then you get hit hard and you end up in that valley don't make a life-changing decision while you're there don't tell your wife peace out this isn't for me don't uh run away to mexico and i did not run away to mexico just to be clear and also just get you know, we have as men, right? And I don't know if your listeners are, are, are men or women. Again, if you're single, Christian, female, then okay. Kelly will give you my contact <laughs> S- information Single later. Christian females. <laughs> I'm going to have okay. his number and his address in the bio. Okay, wait. Okay, wait. So, <laughs> so, uh, so, back, so back to this, um, this philosophy that we're talking about, right? If, if you're going through these things and you're faced with a tough decision, don't isolate, you know, as men, we just tend to isolate. I can handle this. 
right? I don't want anybody to see that I'm literally in a heap on the floor in my bathroom looking at my bank account and going, who are you, you know? And then when you get around brothers, guys, you know, could you do it with a wife or a girlfriend? I don't know. I didn't try that. But around brothers that support you and love you and say, hey, man, I got you. I'm going to help you. Let's get through this together, you know? Then that isolation piece um, turns into a friendship and then a brother, a brotherhood and then uh, encouraging each other. You know, I, I have one of the maxims in there that says, you know, um, be a voice of encouragement, but specifically in the ear of your friends. If there's a thing that they need encouragement on, I'm saying speak exactly to that thing. Encourage them on that thing. Because once you feel good about that in self, then you say, okay, maybe things aren't as uh, foobard as I thought they were, and I can start working on this next thing. So how, how do you, because there, there's, we, we got a winter coming financially. We know this. It's coming. Um, the, the indicators are there. We've talked about them, and I want to talk about the indicators. But also, mm-hmm. too, people are going to go into a winter. They're going to, you know, they're going to learn. We're going to learn lessons. We're going to go through it. Like you said, we should not go into the freeway with the padded suit because the bus doesn't care. We should learn to stay off the freeway, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So what about when, and I, I got to see this and watch this with you, and I've never said this to you before, but I saw you, Uh-oh. and I, I saw you coming, right? And I saw you repairing. I saw you repairing. And then, mm. you know, in the last year, it's been amazing because, I mean, you got a phenomenal promotion, uh, well-deserved. Yeah. Now you're starting to, Thank and you. things are starting to go, like things are starting to get like really good. But I still notice the exact same Jay. Like I don't see Jay running out and buying gold chains and, you know, pulling up in the Bentley and all the stuff. Jay is still making sure. How do you, how can one stay in that when things start to go good? Because people don't prepare us for when they go yeah. good. They always tell us to prepare for the worst. Yeah, so it, it's a little of both. I, I think this is one of those examples where two things are equally true. Yes, we are expecting a winter, and how do you defend against winter at your home? Now in San Diego, it's kind of tough. You know, <laughs> sunny, sunny and 75 in winter doesn't really prepare you for what winter feels like. Now, when I visited South Dakota, I got a little taste of what that might be like in the coming future. But we know that it's coming. So what does that mean for you? You know, is your lifestyle, uh, is, is, is your current and present lifestyle contingent upon the trees continuing to grow to the sky? If it is, you might need to make some adjustments. That's all. And, you know, I keep mentioning my mentors and, you know, we talk about reading all these books and I'm like, hey, these, uh, I'm applying these principles right along with you. You know, the, the learning never stops. Remain a student, not a follower. I'm, I'm studying right with you. It's like, okay, if I know this to be the case, what are some moves that I could make personally in my own life to make sure that when winter comes, even if it sucks for a while, like even if, even if it's less than 60 degrees in San Diego, which when that happens, I turn into a crybaby, um, you know, it's, it's coming. So how can I be prepared? Just don't be surprised, right? If somebody says, I never knew there was going to be a correction in the real estate market. I would say, do you live under a rock or are you only 16 years old and maybe you haven't experienced one? I mean, that's why, that's why the Bible is such an awesome tool for you and I. It's like, okay, it's the ultimate playbook. It tells you, here's what's going to happen if you do the right thing. Here's what you can expect if you do the wrong thing. Here's some knuckleheads that did the wrong thing. And here's what happened as a result of them choosing that wrong thing. So learn from this, okay? Hey, great plan. Now, let's look at the other side. Here's some dudes that did it the right way. Here's the dudes that had the heart, uh, you know, for Jesus, if you, if you want to break it down into uh, our Christian brotherhood, right? And here's what you can expect here. Again, it's not, it's not all, you know, sunshine and rainbows, right? We deal with stuff. We're on a planet where stuff happens but it's no mystery. They said, no mystery. You can literally go pick up a book on American history, go back uh, two centuries and look at all the stuff between then and now. 
say, okay, you know, I, I can expect in my lifetime that I'm probably going to go through some stuff, right? Les Brown said, I'm either in a problem, about to get into a problem, or just got out of one. It's one of those three, you know, you could, it's just going to happen. So prepare, prepare yourself. And by prepare yourself, whatever that means for you, it might be just get smarter, you know, study, apply the things that you're learning. It might be as simple as that, or it might be, you know, change, change the way that you approach things, you know, the, maybe the six steps to uh, how to, you know, jumpstart your day. Maybe that, maybe that's a thing you should be doing during that wintry season. It might very well be, you know, Jim Rohn, we would say, you know, use that to uh, replenish yourself and get strong and, and prepare yourself for the inevitable spring, which is coming again at some point. You know, if you've got your sails on the right side of that thing and you've got your mind and your heart in the right place, then you can endure, um, you can endure that winter. And that's really, uh, I, I want to speak specifically to anybody that's in a thing, you know, endurance, uh, endurance pays, right? Uh, my friend Steve Miller said, uh, long-term obedience in any direction always produces a payday. So think about that. If you have long-term obedience to becoming a better version of you, it's going to produce a payday. Now, it might not happen tomorrow, and it might not happen six months from now, or in my case, it might take literally a decade, but if you stay in the game, at least you got a shot. What are some of the things, Jay, that you're seeing right now that are indicators? Because, like, I asked you the question the last time that we got to spend time together, and I was like, <clears throat> there's parts that the normal uh, society does not understand, right? Like, yeah. it, it yeah. puzzled me that nobody was working, nothing was open, and, yeah. you know, real estate went through the roof. And then when, yeah. it, when we came back, then it was like real estate continued to go through the roof, People are spending crazy amounts of money, all these things. And I just kept asking, like, how is this happening, Jay? But you seem to have a very calm, you know, uh, researched kind of answer, you know, in it. And, uh, like, help people to understand how this is happening. What indicators are you seeing that there is a winter coming? Okay, well, uh, you, can, you can rely somewhat on the media for some aspects. Usually they're a little slow on the uptake, like our friend said in uh, Meet the Parents. But when, when you look at what's happening with an increase in inventory in our market, in the real estate side of things, you know, supply and demand is causing price reductions. I, I, I clipped this graph the other day of, it was something crazy, like the number of properties in San Diego County that had a price reduction in the last four weeks. And it was 35% of these properties. Now, if you had looked at that, you know, three months ago or whatever, it might have been one or 2%. I didn't go back further to check it. I was just looking at that. It was kind of an alarming statistic. It's like, okay, that's interesting by itself. But what does it mean? To your point, it's an indicator. Something is changing. What is changing? And how am I going to position myself? If I'm a seller and I think, hey, uh, Supply is increasing, demand is decreasing, interest rates are rising, people are uncertain about their future. What do most people do when they're uncertain, Kelly? They freeze. What do I do, right? They don't move, they don't sell, they don't buy, they just kind of park, just like you and me. You know, as individuals, something gets ugly and sideways in our life, we just kind of pull off to the side of the road and say, I'm just gonna sit here, I'm not gonna put my hazards on, I'm just gonna chill. It's like, okay, that might be an appropriate response. But if, if an entire market does that, nothing is moving, what's going to be the byproduct? Things won't sell. Things won't move. How do we get them to sell? What are our options? Do we go and spend money and make it better so we can command a higher price? Probably not. Do we lower the price until some guys goes, that seems like a good deal at that price. I'm in. And maybe they test that bottom, right? So, so these are indicators, things that are coming. And then when you look at this employment piece, th this is the part that you and I, um, like we had our own aha conversation is, if, if somebody's not yet feeling the sting, and when I saw a $7 gas tank, I could, or gas gallon gas, I was feeling the sting in my 2011 Tahoe truck, which holds like 18 gallons, right? And it goes past 100, and I'm like, what's happening? It's like, okay, I, I, I felt that sting, but not enough for me to really change my behavior. 
Okay. So until people start losing their jobs and eating into their savings, which they've got more savings that they've ever had, until that starts to happen, then the behaviors will not change. So be aware of that. Once you start to see behavior change, this is the behaviors of, of spending more than you make, right? Easy credit at low interest or zero interest rates, right? These are indicators. They're not gonna continue forever. Once people start to feel the pain, then you'll start to see a change in behavior. And then that's where you'll start to see, in my opinion, a more significant correction in the real estate values. Maybe not, you know, we're somewhat insulated, right? We live in this, uh, I literally God's chosen spot. I mean, other than <laughs> Israel, <laughs> like if you, did you see the sunset last night? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. The sunset last night was literally off the charts and followed up by that was this sick moonrise that came up over from the east with a little bit of the sliver of the moon missing because it's kind of an eclipse happening or something. It's like, come on. He How can you lying. say that this was a random act? You know, it's like, come on. Somebody's designing this for us. We're lucky. We live here. I mean, how, how lucky are we to live in this place? Come on. It's the, it's honestly, it's the best place in the world. Let me, let me ask you this, Jay. Like, uh, you yeah. know, you have a, you have a daughter. Um, I do. Do you have, you have multiple or you just have one daughter? We call that one and done, my one friend. One and done. So with one and done, what has your daughter taught you about leadership? Oh, my gosh. Um, it reminds me of a story. So when she was little, she, um, she had a piggy bank where she would, you know, collect all the spare change and whatever. And if she did a lemonade stand, she'd put her money in there and whatever. And um, I had come home from some conference. And I had said, hey, you know, uh, my friend Les, right, Les Brown, he goes, he's got cancer. She goes, oh, cancer. Like, what's that, daddy? And I kind of walked her through this whole deal, you know. And then she disappears off to her room and comes down a little bit later. And she's got, like, all her money in this little, I don't know, it was a Ziploc bag or something. And she had this little book, and it said, Beat Cancer Club. And she said, I'm going to get my friends to join this beat cancer club and we're going to collect our money and you can give it to your friend Lance, Right. I'm like, okay. She gets it, right? She gets it. You're never too old to learn. You're never too young to teach. She teaches me all the time and she's uh, faithfully not gone off the rails, right? She has not turned into a prodigal. I have not had to uh, correct her. The, the last time that she got a spanking, which was with a magazine and not my, hand was, I think maybe she was five years old, right? That did the trick. Never, never got off the rails. So again, thankful and blessed. And she is, uh, as you can probably tell, daddy's little girl. And uh, yeah, she's, she's wise beyond her years. If there's ever a case for somebody having an old soul, she owns one. Well, here in hearing that story, you know, we're, we're called to be childlike and not to be childish. A lot of times I think men as men, uh, we, we, we forget the, 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 the line between the two. And so yeah. how can a person, especially flying in the circles that you are and in the position that you are, I mean, it, it, you're, can I, can I, can I say when you were saying that your, the goals for your company are outrageous, astronomical. I mean, we're, t we're talking in the billions of dollars. Am I correct? You are. Yeah. Okay. They're, and we're, they're, yeah, that's the billions with a B. Yes. And we're and talking. Some con Go ahead. <laughs> and let me Go. give you, let me give you one more step of context around that. You know, uh, when I moved into this role almost a year ago, um, <clears throat> the, the way that I put it to my friends was this thing was uh, headed for certain doom, uh, like an airplane headed towards the Hudson. And we landed this puppy like Sully Sullenberger and everybody lived. It's like, we've, we've taken this thing from a mess to uh, something really awesome. And, you know, again, I just happen to be, you know, in the right place with my sales pointed in the right direction with the right set of skills and prepared for when opportunity knocks. And uh, again, I, I attribute all of that to uh, humility, faith, my relationship with God and um, my desire to want that to be infused in our business and everything we do. And I hope he blesses us with those goals. I mean, I, I would be, Hey God, um, if you decide <laughs> you want to do it, 
<laughs> I'm in. You know, can, and it's can a you give it, I mean, we're gonna give we're gonna give it a go. Jay, can you give a scope to 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 the type of growth that you guys have been able to see in this last year? Because, I mean, are you allowed to say it? It's it's actually publicly available data. Yeah. So let's talk you about it. Let's talk you could, about it. you could literally, you could, since we're a publicly traded company, you could literally go and research the stock symbol AX, and you could look at our phenomenal growth quarter after quarter, year after year, so, and most recently in, in the last fiscal year and over the last quarter, um, coincidentally, while I was in the chair. So um, give us the give us the cliff notes, then, man. I mean, within this last year, tell us some stats, some things that you know. And I, you're not beating your chest because I'm asking, but. I believe the listeners won't want to hear, and it helps us to be able to gain that scale because we're talking Bs, Bs, A, B, billions. We're talking billions. Yeah. And this, the man in front of you is not talking about these things that he's beating his chest and saying all about his education. What he's saying is if you have the right heart, the right things will happen, but it doesn't mean that it's just the heart. You have to have the procedures in place too. But what is some of, what's some of those growth? What's some of the growth, Jay? Well, to give you, um, let me see if I can quantify it this way. <laughs> so from a, from a people perspective, okay. our, te- our team, my, my team that reports directly to me has grown from uh, seven, I'll say six and a half because one of them was new to the game at that time, okay. to I'm about to add my 19th person to that team. So, you know, I don't know, that's not quite let's see, it's not quite tripled, but it's on the path and, and we are continuing to grow. Now to give uh, the listeners a little context, uh, in my role, I manage the relationships or, or my team manages the relationships between the mortgage banking community and our bank. So that's a, that's a high profile, high potentially stressful, high um, activity and output role and subsequently, because it's a sales role and a commission only role, it's also very lucrative for somebody who's got game, right? So <laughs> part, of my, part of my responsibility is to attract talent that can live in that world. And thankfully, um, by either uh, my version of the law of attraction uh, and blessed by my maker, uh, we're, we're getting the right people. <laughs> so he, you said you went from six to 19. That's over three times. It's almost, it's all, I mean, we're almost into the, almost into the four times, but over three times that part of it, it it's incredible. What about the increase, you know, the increase uh, that, you, that you're seeing? Have you seen an increase in the, in the millions? Have you seen an increase in the billions? Yeah, it's, it's actually in the hundreds of millions. Yeah. So, so previously, if you looked at year over year, for example, if you went back to, uh, let's say the numbers for July, I would say June. Like if you went to June, that we've got official numbers for that. If you went year over year, our our volume doubled in that month. That particular month was, I think, close to 200 million. To give you some scope. The reason why I say this is because it's not about the money, but I want you yeah, to stop cussing re- me for numbers. No, but I love it. I love it because I want the people to understand that you can still have a heart when you're dealing at the levels that you're dealing with. Because Thank I think you. a lot of sure. times people think that you either you know, like you, we, we can go and hard charge after the hundreds of millions, the billions, or we can have our yeah. heart. You're an example, which there's not many of you. But you're an example, and that's what the pod, this whole podcast is about. It's not about what the people do. It's who they are. But yeah. generally, when you are the type of person you are, you end up with the returns that you end up with. Like that, that, Those things not always coincide, but there, there's a, a correlation between the two of them. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more completely. So in the, in the part that you're describing, I think we get it backwards, right? We think, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get successful. And then I'm going to do this and this and this and be this and this and this and this is how I'm going to roll. Once I have this, whatever, right? And then really it's like, you've got to be that first. And then we know that like attracts like in, in the, again, we could get into the quantum woo woo law of attraction space if you want to. I don't know how much time we got left in this thing, but I could literally spend hours on it. But if like attracts like, and that's true, 
and we can see that in our daily experience and we can test it and we can see how it rolls, then if I'm being heart centered and I'm being pure in my motives and I'm doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. And I don't care whether somebody's watching it or giving me a pat on the back and saying, Hey, you're a great guy, bro. Keep doing what you're doing. Like every once in a while. Yeah, I need that. You know, I need guys like you that understand that words of affirmation is my primary love language. So when you're speaking so highly of me, yes, I get fired up and I get mileage from that. Right. And the opposite is also true. If all you did is came on here and say, you're such a dog. I can't believe the son of a, you are, you know, then I'm going to be like, Whoa, hang on. That's going to hurt me in a different way too. But the, the whole, if I were, if I were going to relate it to success in any role, it would not just be to maintain that, that heart, but also to surround yourself with people that can support you when you don't feel like doing it on any given day. And, and I can assure you, I have those days. There are days where I do want to bounce and just skip to Mexico, you know, but then how hard would that be for me to get an appointment on your calendar, which is already literally <laughs> I'm fighting, I'm fighting all the ladies. They say, wait, how did he get, how did he get 10 a.m.? That's my weekly spot, you know. Like, okay. so, so I know somebody. <laughs> well, talk to, talk to us too about like um, when you, when you were saying like attracts like, and let's, uh, I want to go down, I'd like to go down that rabbit hole. A lot okay. of times we buy into this side that opposites attract and, and you need to have this mm. opposite. And when I used to think that too. You know, I used to think because I remember in my first marriage, right? And so, yeah. you know, I was married before. I was married for a very short amount of time. Is the only time I ever thought I was a celebrity because I was only married for like uh, 13 months, I think it was. And that's when a record. I, that's a, that was strong. I was I was a celebrity, man. And in my first marriage, um, I went towards what I knew as truth, which was, um, you know, growing up, I was around a lot of fighting. There was a, a ton of fighting and then people, then my parents would make up and my, my parents loved each other, but there was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of stuff. They were married very yeah. early. They had some challenges. And so I gravitated towards a person who was kind of opposite from me and mm. was maybe, you know, was, and, and we fought a lot and I thought that was love. And then my brother told me, he was like, it's okay to be okay. And then I met my wife and you know her, Brooklyn. And yeah. Like to see her and to see Does the she joy. Have a twin? Was that? Does she have a twin? Does I would. Hey, if she had a twin, she would be married to every single one of my my friends. Like <laughs> I'm telling you. I mean that that sounded weird. So don't sound by okay. me on that. Hey, hey, Brooke. Okay, nobody's being weird. Everybody's back on track. Yes. So, but I'm I'm telling you, like once I realized that, then I started to yeah. realize, wow, I don't have to go after someone who is this complete opposite, but that's what we as men always go after, mm. right? So you have, like, if you're this, and women, you guys do this also, if you have, you know, your dad loved you and you grew up in that, a lot of times you go after the bad boy. With us, mm. if we're going down the right path, a lot of times we go after the woman who is going to maybe, you know, shift us, shift a little bit, you know? So yeah. talk to that, that same side attraction or a, attracting okay. like. Yeah. Okay. So, so I think we're, we're definitely talking about a couple different aspects. So let's first look at the opposites attract component yeah. of uh, what we're really talking about is polarity, right? And you need to have both the positive and the negative to create a circuit, right? So I think that there is, um, there's elements of truth in needing to not find a clone of you uh, to be your uh, mate, spouse, whatever it might be. Now, it might look cool seeing Brooke with dreadlocks, for example, but a clone of you isn't really going to get it done. Now, I would bet, and although I don't know Brooklyn to the degree that um, I hope to in the future, is that She's probably got a little spice in there, a little spicy when you need it, right? Just like I put it on my fish tacos when I want to have a little <laughs> kick in there, you know? There's, there's nothing wrong with uh, having spicy in there. But another thing that I know is that you guys, uh, on the things that matter, you guys are in alignment. Mm -hmm. You're not, there's no disconnect there, right? You agree. Your principles are in alignment. You 
you, um, you know, some, somebody asked me like, how do I know, uh, let's, let's say that I uh, start dating a girl and uh, we're on the street after dinner, taking a nice starlit walk and there's a homeless guy on the street and I'm taking my to-go food home and I'm like, you know what, I'm going to see if this bro's hungry. And so I say, hey, bro, you, you're camping, you, you want some food? And he goes, oh, yeah, I would love that. Now, if her response to that same guy was, oh my God, get a job, you loser, get out of our face, stop that. I mean, it just, it wouldn't work, right? It's, it's too far opposite. That's the opposite. It's certainly not attractive in that example, right? So what are the core elements that you can uh, agree upon? And this is what, uh, in relationship, us guys, rarely we're thinking about all of these really critical components of what it's like to be with this girl. All we're thinking about is what is it like to be with this girl and not really who is this woman? Who is this heart? Who is, who is the beyond the meat suit? Who is that spiritual being that, that I'm feeling this connection towards, right? We, we sometimes, sometimes we, get, uh, we get that part screwed up. But when it comes to, um, when it comes to the appeal of something that is foreign to how we would ordinarily do things, I'm got, not going to deny that that exists. For every person, I think you need to evaluate that. What's most important for me? You know, we were talking about self-acceptance before, and I was saying that I wanted to, you know, go down this road a little bit. Until, you, until you're really okay with you, which, I mean, most days I'm okay with me. Some, some days I'm not okay with me. You know, I do a lot of, I do a lot of things that, uh, you know, I probably shouldn't do according to somebody else's rules. But then I think, wait, I don't live by anybody's rule. Really? I'm me. I'm going to be me. You be you. And we'll see how that works out. And so in, in this like attracts like piece of things, I think that if you're looking in relationship for a longer term mate, someone that you can uh, connect with on all levels, uh, mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, financially, whatever all those elements are for you. If you're thinking about those things and you have a clear vision of what those things look like, again, in this law of attraction world that we live in and our thoughts creating an effect and that effect creating another thought and then another and then another and then another, if you're focused on those things, you can expect them to become part of your experience. If you're focused on bad things, you can expect that to be part of your experience. Like, like that part's not rocket science, so to speak. You know, it's just the way it is. So what side of is do you want to be on? Well, I think it's incredible too, uh, Jay, because uh, for those of you out there listening, you just heard it. Like you just gave a blueprint for relationships, the exact principle based that you gave for your financial, uh, for financial health. And I want you at some point, Jay, I want you to go back and listen to this because the way that you talked about the financial health, it was being able to be calm, sometimes park on the side of the road, wait for the storm to go by, don't make a decision in those times, think long term. And then you related that. And it wasn't like you were doing it, uh, like, you know, you were saying it to the person. But principle based, it was exactly the same when you were talking about building in a, in a relationship, you know, and I just I think it's amazing the consistency that you have you know, throughout, throughout your life. Um, this is a subject that I want to talk about that I, I've never got a chance to talk about on the podcast before. Dun, we've, dun, dun. We've, Play the we've, music. Dun, we've, dun, both, dun. we've both experienced it, and it's not something that a lot of guys talk about. Um, we, mm. bo- we both <laughs> have been divorced. Kelly. Okay. We've both, we, uh, yeah, somewhere. exactly. I thought you were going somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> So we, we both have been divorced with, with myself. Um, a huge yeah. part of it was communication. I mean, for me, it yeah. was, it was massive on the communication side and I can't blame, yeah. like, I can't blame her. And I, I mean, I have to blame myself. I have to look at myself in the communication and also to mm-hmm. the immaturity that I had at the time and things like that. Um, what lessons did you learn? Um, and, you know, what are some of the things as you move forward that, that maybe you'll take into the next relationships? Yeah, for sure. Wow. This is a, this is an onion that we could peel for days. Um, you know, the, the, the core question as I'm hearing it is knowing what you now know, what would you do differently? And <laughs> if, if, if that's true, then we can address that. And then with regards to uh, my role in, in the 
situation. So uh, frankly, you know, the, we were on two different tracks. You know, I was getting closer in my relationship to God and she wasn't along for that ride. And so that started to drive a wedge. And then ultimately that wedge became something else and something else. And uh, it, it went to a point where it was beyond recovery. Now, in that season, um, I was not taking responsibility really for it myself. You know, I've, I've learned this principle. Uh, my friend Doria Cordova runs a program called Money and You, and it's about principles. And, and these different principles are in there. And one of them was this concept of the line of responsibility. Where, and, and if you, responsibility is above the line and then below the line is uh, justification, shame, and blame. And it's like, okay, are you living above the line or not? So we tend to, as human beings, go straight to blame. I can't believe her. She was such a blah, da, da, and whatever. Or we go to shame. I can't believe how much of a loser I am. Why am I not man enough to solve this problem, you know, beating up on myself or justification, which was my favorite tool, which was like, hey, I'm doing it for the sake of uh, the marriage because I'm a till death do us part kind of guy. So I would justify, justify, justify what we were going through. And uh, let me just say, I wouldn't wish what I was going through on anybody ever, anywhere, but I didn't accept responsibility for what was I doing as a catalyst for all of those elements. It took me a long time to learn that long after uh, the end of our marriage, which now has been um, seven years, which is mm. like really shocking for me to think about it in those terms when I think about years. But uh, yeah, so, um, you know, are you living above the line in your relationships? Are you living above the line in your business? Are you living above the line with your uh, kids and your associates, right? Are you taking responsibility or are you in this blame, shame, and justify mode? And if you are, it's great. You recognized it. Now do something about it, right? The next time you catch yourself blaming somebody for a thing, uh, you know, traffic was heavy, you know, that's why I'm an hour late. It's like, okay, I guess, maybe. Or is it that you didn't think ahead? I don't know, maybe. Um, or I can't, you know, if you're beating yourself up, please, please stop. If you want somebody just to chill and hang out with and have a conversation with, you know, Kelly, Kelly's actually super easy to find because he's all over the internet. He's all over uh, Facebook is all over, you know, me, I'm a, a little bit more challenging to, to find because I go by an alias, but reach out to us. You know, I said before accessibility, I see as a responsibility and not a privilege, you know, if you just want somebody to chill and hang out with and have a conversation about all kinds of crazy stuff uh, and keeping it real, then, uh, you know, like I said, we're, we're easy to find. Well, I think it's, I think it's incredible because you give an authentic, uh, you know, an authentic mentorship. And so many people throw away, uh, throw around the word mentor because they're like, oh, I saw Gary V on two videos. Therefore, he's my mentor. I'm like, no, if he yeah. gave you advice, you followed it. And then you took it back to him and said, this is what I did. And this was the result. Then you could start to talk about mentorship. And what, uh, what I noticed, Jay, is I talked about this. This was a brainchild. I'm going to throw it out there and, and someone's going to take it. But um, this was a brainchild. I was like, you know, I have so many friends that have been amazingly successful in their careers and then they retire or you know maybe they just don't need anything anymore and I started asking all these friends I said what if there was a group of young uh, entrepreneurs what would it take for you to sit with them and maybe give them advice help them through and every one of them had the exact same uh, ask from me I said what, what would it take would it take equity in their company would it be a, a, a monthly fee what would it be and every one of them, 100% of them said the exact same thing, Jay. You know what it was? Let me guess. Let me guess. Apply what I recommend and report back to me. Exactly. Exactly. And, I, and then I asked them, and then I asked them, Jay, I was like, how much will that cost? And they said, I, I don't need anything. I don't want any other company. I don't want anything. So all well, of that's, you, that's, 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 that's where I go off the rails. I want to check. No, I'm kidding. Of course. Yeah. But I don't, it's, I, it, I don't want to check. It's amazing because young, young people out there, a lot of times, and young entrepreneurs or young business owners, a lot of times we think we're on an island. And 
Yeah. You know, when I first opened my first, first business, I was like, man, I was very fortunate because I had a lot of people around me, but I was scared to ask for help. And yeah. if you want help, Coach J, Coach J dot com or uh, J, uh, Coach, uh, Coach yeah, Shoop, Coach Shoop dot com. Coach Shoop, yeah. Coach <laughs> yeah, Shoop that's, that's com. true. That's right. And, and, you know, I, again, I keep espousing the wisdom of my mentors, but, you know, we talked about this before. Um, the, the words that we hear, like, let's say, for example, like if you have a new King James Bible, it's kind of tough to read that, you know, especially if you go back to the Old Testament, it's like, oh my gosh, do I really have to read this? And then we have to figure out a way to communicate to the next generation these personal development principles and these ideas in a language that they can understand and then apply. And so that's why someone like you is uh, so compelling to me to watch in this desire and this heart for not only youth, but actually young or um, entrepreneurs that are early stage in their game, like figuring out, you know, how should I, how, how can I improve here and there? And you've got a heart for that, which is, which is amazing. And how, what interests me about that is that uh, it's, it's genuine and it's in a language that's easy to understand. And that's where, that's where we can be, we meaning you, me, the personal development community, the vortex that is San Diego can be um, uh, a voice of hope and change by recognizing how the message used to be delivered isn't working. It's falling on deaf ears, right? It's not working. So if it's not working, what are you doing to figure out a way to make it work? And, you know, that's, that's why, um, that's why I'm a fan, Kelly. That's why I'm your <laughs> fan. I'm a fanboy. <laughs> uh, friend, friend, friend. Tell, talk to me. We, we mentioned and alluded before about masterminds. You talked about how important they are. Um, yeah. I just went to one up in Salt Lake. My friend, uh, Sean Finnegan, shout, shout out to him. This guy is phenomenal. Jay, you need to meet him. Uh, Sean okay. Finnegan, he called me. He's like, hey, man, we're going to dinner. He said, come to dinner, me and a couple of friends. Well, I show up, there's 16 dudes all around the table in a private room in a, uh, in a uh, pizza place, right? And I sit down and they had four questions. And these four questions were so amazing. They just said, what's your name? What's your company? What's your superpower? And what's your ask? And mm -hmm. at first I was like, what's my ask? I don't need it. And then I started, we started going around the room and there was 12 or 13 people who had exited from companies, four or five of them had exited from, you know, multiple companies. And every time a person had to ask, there was four or five people that were like, well, I, I kind of do that already. I can help you. And I sat in this room and I was like, where did this happen? Like, why haven't I been? So we're actually going to be starting one, Jay. And so I want to, I want you to be a part of it here in San Diego where we bring mm -hmm. like minds together. Um, you come mm -hmm. and, and our, what we did was it cost me how much it was for the pizza split between 16 people. And we had a social media person there, which we're going to do this here in San Diego too. And then we'll have social yeah. clips and stuff like that. It cost me $69 to sit with these guys for two and a half hours yeah. and be filled up. Yeah. How important are masterminds in this world right now for men? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, you, you hit the nail on the head. If anybody you know, a lot of times money is a barrier to a thing. It's a, it's a real world, right? We're all at different stages in our lifetime economically. I can show you a screenshot of my bank account when uh, it had pennies in it as an example. Uh, and I keep that as a motivator. But also, you know, when I made the decision that I wasn't going to allow my bank balance to determine my value and worth on the planet, you know, things started to change for me. And so having other men... In this case, hey, no disrespect to our, our girls, our ladies, our friends, our kids, our daughters, or whatever. There's just something about the camaraderie of brothers side by side, shoulder to shoulder. You know, we don't really sit like this face to face too often. Even on the internet here, we're side by side. We're not looking at each other, right? So it's just not common. So once you have an opportunity to spend that kind of time with guys that are like-minded, achievement-driven, that have a heart for... Uh, everything that matters, then uh, you can fully expect that the outcome is going to be uh, synergistic and something better than what was there before is going to be the result. 
Well, it, it's incredible, man. We started the, uh, we ran the commercial at the very beginning, which is the hideout. I think I told you about the hideout. And mm -hmm. the, the hideout mm -hmm. is, is, is focused on all joy, right? So when you, well, I find when you, when you seek joy, which the, to understand the meaning of joy, and this is the meaning that my parents gave to me, it was falling in love mm. with your current circumstances and allowing magic to happen. It wasn't chasing mm. circumstance to make me happy, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, what I found different. was, is when we as men are filled up with joy, then all the rest of it, that, and that joy is falling in love with our current circumstances, allowing magic to happen. When that is filled yeah. up, then it just flows into every other part. And it's like we start profiting at a higher level. We start, you know, our businesses, our teams grow, all these things. But when we're focused on the bottom line, we yeah. don't end up with joy, right? <laughs> and it was funny. Not as, not as often. Not as often. And, and we seek it, though. We think we could buy it. That's what I thought yeah. as a kid. I was like, well, if I make Same. all this money, Same. then I'll be able to buy I could stuff. Tell you, I, could tell you, I could tell you that that number for me, to give you some context, in, um, let's see, in 1998, somebody was making 10 grand a month, okay? And they, mm -hmm. they proved it with the checks they were making in their multi-level marketing business, right? They proved <laughs> it. So, um, and no disrespect to my MLM friends, right? We're all- Shout we're out all to there, you, that shout out. Yeah. I, I don't want to make it sound like I'm slamming. I'm just telling you these checks look super authentic and they were 10 grand. And it, to me, that was like the mother load, right? Oh, if I could make 10 grand a month, like every other problem in my life would be solved. And it just doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> Well, and it's funny because we started the hideout, right? And then I had a yeah. group. I had a group of women come to me. I spoke at a mastermind just recently, Prosperity Camp, which uh, with Greg Reed. And yeah. I, I had a woman, Debbie. Shout out to you. You know who you are. She came to me and she was like, "Why isn't it for women?" And I, mm. and I, I froze and I was like, well, it's for guys. And she's like, and she stood and she gave me a hard time. She was, she's a very, she's a good friend of mine, but she was like, why yeah. isn't there one for women? And so we actually, she, I've said, well, I haven't, I, I mean, uh, we wanted to do it for men. We were doing the mastermind, all the stuff. And then she's like, well, we as women want to go. And I said, well, do you have 12 friends? She said, yes. So we actually, right now we have 10 uh, women go into the women's hideout that was built by women. And so my wife is coming, we're bringing in women speakers. We're going to be doing yeah. these things, but Fine. it's, it's amazing because I think that both sides, whether it be men, especially, I mean, Jay and I are men, obviously. And, but I think with men or women, you guys getting together and having a, a, a like mind is so very important. Am I correct on this, Jay? Yeah, it's well, it, correct in that in that critical component that there's cooperation and harmony right now i've been around a group of 10 women that uh, are like cats and just mean and evil to each other and wonder how do you guys call yourself friends the things that you're saying to each other oh it's just you know we're just whatever and guys kind of do the same thing with each other too right we can give each other the business now and then and twist the knife and uh, sometimes we can do it out of a heart of love sometimes we can do it with uh, uh loving toes and other times we do it in a not not a nice way that's the the human fallacy of our uh you know our reality but if the heart's right and the objectives are right and the goal is to how are we going to use uh, our coordinated efforts to elevate not only our own game but anybody that we come into uh, our sphere then yeah i say build it and they will come <laughs> So I was listening to a song the other day, Jay, and it's right in line with this. And I want you to speak to this because you said that you have, you know, the, the lion and the lamb kind of a situation. You talked mm -hmm. about that earlier. Mm -hmm. You talked about mm -hmm. the fact that you're not okay with something that doesn't bring results. And that's okay in your mind, even though you're a servant leader. Yeah. There was a song lyric that said, it's by Dilated People. It's one of my favorites. And it said, mm -hmm. uh, in the chorus, it said, don't take my kindness for weakness. Can you speak to this and how a person can be as kind as who you are, but still be a, a, a alpha and be a killer yeah. in what it is that you do? Yeah. Well, okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to defer from the alpha reference and say that what I hear in that result or in that uh, circumstance is a quote that I heard once that said, we don't ask for help because we're weak we ask for help to remain strong. And that is, that is what you're describing here, right? Not knowing it all 
I mean, okay. I, I want to genuinely not offend anybody, but the concept of, in my mind, of being woke, for example, is uh, an instance in which we're not looking at the core issue of something that needs to be dealt with directly and succinctly and with truth and a heart for truth. And subsequently, it can be deemed as being soft if you opt to do anything but that. So it's definitely got nuance and it's got balance, but it's certainly not a sign of weakness. It's a sign in my assessment of being willing to do what's required, being strong and convicted in your own beliefs in the circumstances, and then doing it with a heart of love and kindness and for all the right reasons. And, and I've mentioned previously about this idea of self-acceptance, you know, I, I heard this quote that said, um, a lack of self-acceptance will always manifest itself in the form of obstacles. So think about that. If you have obstacles in your life, which of them are rolling back to you not being okay with you being uniquely you? And then go to work on that. Just don't be okay with it. Once you recognize it, it's like, okay, now what am I going to do about that? That's where, that's where growth comes from. That's where um, you so kindly called it uh, wisdom, which uh, to me is uh, uh, the result of making dozens and hundreds and thousands of mistakes in all of these areas of my life, some as recently as yesterday and still showing up today. <laughs> tell, us, uh, tell us about the, the, uh, the, the most recent and fresh mistake um, that you've made in your life, whether it be business or be personal. Well, definitely on the business side. So um, again, this is not me blowing my own horn. I get a ridiculous number of emails every day and phone calls. Some, some people contextually might go, oh, that's nothing. To me, I call it ridiculous. Um, sometimes the email inbox on a daily basis has a comma in it, and that'll give you some idea. And then the number of inbound calls that I take is, uh, my, my, my friends at work lovingly, lovingly call me a cyborg by being able to feel that high of a volume of inbound activity. And sometimes I can get triggered. And yesterday I got triggered and, and, uh, the person on the receiving end of that phone call, uh, received something that my guess is they didn't perceive as loving toes. It was more of a, um, backhanded slap to the grill. And I cleaned that up today, by the way, you know, I didn't, I didn't let that hang out there. I, I went back and I cleaned that thing up, uh, which is a valuable and uh, requirement of your own personal growth and self acceptance is when you say, hi, I messed that up. I, I need to, I need to be okay. I need to fix that thing. And what's it going to take? In this case, it was an apology and a sincere, Hey, that's, that's not me. I attempted not to justify, you know, I've got all these circumstances. I've got these emails, blah, blah, blah. We just talked about taking responsibility and not justifying and blaming and shaming, but I knew intrinsically I had to clean that thing up. And so that's what I did at the first opportunity. And that's, again, for, for those of you out there that are uh, committing these crimes of uh, blame, shame, and justification, take responsibility. Let's grow together. We're figuring it out. Test it. See what your results are, right? Because what do we, what most of us do, right? We're just going to let that thing go and go. We're not going to circle back and try and clean it up because it might be messy still. You know? They might still be bruised. Well, if you don't, if you don't go clean that up, how do you ever expect that thing to heal? Jay, one of the things that I hear through all, uh, like the undertones of everything is <clears throat> you not only have the ability to be able to give grace to other people, but you give it to the most important place in the world, which is yourself. And this is the hardest mm -hmm. place for people to give grace. Yeah. Very, very yeah. few people are willing to forgive themselves. How have you perfected that art? And you're going to say, I didn't perfect it. I'm still doing it. <laughs> But how do you continue to stay in that? Oh, wait, realm? you answer you you answer you answer for me. You know what I'm gonna say. Try that <laughs> one again. Okay, so <laughs> So how how are you able to perfect that art of giving grace to yourself? Because I think that's the place where a lot a, a lot of people out there listening, myself, we can give grace to everyone. We can forgive everyone, but when it comes to ourselves, yeah. giving grace to ourselves is is and, and it's crazy because it gives us such 
amazing power. It gives you the craziest superpower in the world when you're willing to forgive mm. yourself. But most yeah. of us don't know how to do it. Yeah, well, the, the interesting thing is, um, at least in my experience, forgiveness is rarely taught or how to, how to measure the degree of forgiveness. For example, it's like, okay, you've had somebody say to you, oh, I forgive you, Kelly. And that's not the heart of the matter, right? That's, those were words, lip service. They weren't the real deal, right? Same thing, that little, that little voice on my shoulder goes, oh, you're forgiven, bro, live forgiven. Jesus says you're forgiven. And I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. That sounds really nice and uh, whatever, but no. Do you know what I've done? Do you know what I did? No, you don't know. Do you know? I don't know. So how do you deal with it? Well, one tool and, and okay, you wanted some methods. Here you go, bro. I'm going to give you a method. Okay. You ready? You ready for it? I'm okay. ready for the J uh, method. Write it uh, down, no, this everyone. Isn't my, this, this, this isn't mine. Just remember, you know, all the information that ever is and ever was and ever will be already exists in the quantum realm. And I'm just tapping into it. That's all that's happening. I love me some Jay. I love me some Jay. Go, go, Jay. Do not, do not attribute this as a quote to me. Okay. So the, the skill is separating the being from the behavior. Mm. Separating the being from the behavior. Once you can do that, then you can start the process of forgiveness. So what do I mean? Okay. So the being, me, and I'm not talking about, uh, again, the meat suit that is me that you see here with my Kelly Cardenas haircut that I got two weeks ago that still looks amazing. Um, the, I'm talking about the non-physical part of me that I share with you and every other person on the planet because that one source element that permeates us all is real. It exists. I'm talking about that part. So if you can separate the behavior from the being, then you can say, okay, that behavior was unacceptable. That, uh, that act that you committed, whatever that was, and this could be in your business, it could be with your wife, it could be with your daughter, it could be, God forbid, um, kicking a puppy, like whatever it is, you know, if you, can, if you can separate those things and then isolate the behavior and correct the behavior, you don't have to, you don't have to crush the being in order to accomplish that end. So when it comes to forgiveness, that's where I would say the first place to start is. Now there's probably a lot of other steps and you want to set up another call. We can get some more tactics in there, but let's, <laughs> let's let that be, let's let that be the one, a two-step process for success and forgiveness. <laughs> Well, I, and I think, I think it's amazing, man. Uh, what have you, like, if you were to, you're talking to, let's talk to a couple of different people. Let's talk to the, uh, the young hard charging entrepreneur. Maybe they're single. Um, they're, you know, on their way to marriage, but they're building mm. their, you know, building their financial wealth, all the stuff. Mm. What, what, what do you say to that kid based off of your experience? I know that you're going to be very humble and be like, you know, take your own path and things like that. But I mean, based off of what you've seen, they come Follow to you your for, purpose. <laughs> they, no. they, they come to you for mentorship. What do you, I mean, yeah. how are you going to prepare them for the winter that possibly might come? Yeah. Yeah. I think the first spot, which I've already alluded to previously is find out. I, I mentioned it as, you know, skills, talent, um, purpose and opportunity is how I presented that piece. And I said, I want to live from the intersection of that. In order to do that, you have to know what those things are. What are your skills? Take an assessment, have somebody you, somebody you love, uh, give you their candid assessment, right? What are you good at? What are your skills, right? Identify them. Am I good at that? Am I not good at that? If somebody, if somebody came to me and says, we've got an amazing role for you, it's going to pay you 400 grand a year. You are going to lead our IT customer service department, and you're going to talk to every person who has a problem with their computer, and they're going to call you, and you're going to walk them through it. And I'm like, I would not take that job at any price. And the person on the other end of that line is going to hear me getting agitated, going, 
there is no any key. Just press any key, right? I would like lose my mind, you know? It's like, what are you good at, okay? You know, what are your skills? What are your talents? And then your opportunities, right? Opportunity looks different for everyone. Sometimes we look at opportunity. I think it was Napoleon Hill and Think and Grow Rich. He read, we said, sometimes we miss it because it shows up in overalls and it looks like work. What, what opportunities exist for you? And once you start to combine those, then you can start to figure out, what do I really care about? What am I not okay with? You know, um, you and I haven't talked about this yet. And I'm not lobbying you a softball so you can tell me how good a guy I am. But I am going to share with you this thing that I've been doing for, um, I don't know, maybe five years or more. And, and maybe even during, yeah, it might even be a decade. Jeez, where have these years gone, Kelly? Um, that I've been doing um, quietly, really talk about it. Every once in a while, I tell somebody about it, like I'm going to share with you. And the billion uh, listeners on Spotify, Apple, uh, YouTube, and whatever. Okay. iHeartRadio, uh, Pandora. And, 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 yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so, I'm doing, so I'm doing it lovingly. lovingly. Thank you, sponsors. Um, there's an organization in the UK called Lend With Care. Lend with care lends micro loans. If you've heard about the concept of microfinance, little loans to entrepreneurs so they can uh, build their business in their country. And it's literally as little as 15 bucks and as much as you want. But here's, here's the interesting, that hap interesting thing that happens as a result of that. So you find these entrepreneurs and you see what they need to get to the next level. And you're like, I got that. I could cover that. That's like, okay, so I'm not gonna go get sushi tomorrow and I'm gonna send 40 bucks to Lend With Care for that entrepreneur. I pick, I like to pick. I'm not telling you what my methodology is for picking, but I pick. So I pick these entrepreneurs and then every month they make a repayment back to Lend With Care. And on about the 28th of every month, I get this email that says, you've received 22 repayments into your Lend With Care account. So what do you wanna do? You wanna cash it in? Or do you want to let it ride, right? And then I go pick some more entrepreneurs and I just let it ride. Now, I'm not doing that because it makes me, well, okay, it kind of makes me feel good, yes. Like that is, all right, let me rephrase. It makes me feel great, right? It makes me feel great knowing that I can have an impact there. And somebody says, well, yeah, but you know, why don't you, why don't you help the people in downtown Carlsbad, whatever. It's like, okay, we can do that too. That's not what I've been called to do in this example. So I'm going to go, where I felt compelled and called. So now letting it ride, I'm literally almost into the hundreds of entrepreneurs that have benefited from these micro loans that are now, you know, I mean, it's, it's some of the most amazing things, right? They, they buy chickens and rice and they stock their shelves and they buy some land and they do all the things that we would totally take for granted or say, how am I gonna change the world you know, on my current salary, how am I going to, um, how am I going to, uh, what's the right word? How, how am I going to invest in others when I, I, I don't have the means to invest in myself? Hey, if that's true, you don't start with money. You can start with time. You can start with your skills, right? I was asking, what are you good at? Like, you know, I'm not an IT guy. Um, what are you good at? Where can I apply those things? And you know, the, the whole um, philosophy, universal principle that uh, what you give will be shaken, stirred, and poured back on you, however many fold, uh, is borne out by my own testing, my own personal testing. And you know, a little plug for Lend With Care, if you wanna go and support some entrepreneurs, you could do it with your lunch money, no problem. And um, you know, Back to that youthful uh, young entrepreneur that's up and coming and wanting to make it, you know, you can do both. It doesn't mm. have to be an either or. We look at stuff like it's always got to be an either or. I'm kind of, as I've grown older, more of a both guy. Mm. Like I want to do both. I want to do all. Now, somebody says, well, there's so many distractions or whatever. Okay, okay, maybe it's not all, but I could do that and I can do that. But what I can't do is nothing. Nothing is not an option. Wow. So what about the, what about the person that maybe is in the, 
senior, uh, you know, the, the senior uh, vice president, the vice presidents, the CEOs, things like that. I mean, you get a chance to be able to speak to them because you are them. Um, and a lot uh, like, yeah. and, and most of the time it's tough to get to them because, you know, a lot of times in that position, people aren't willing to take uh, the, uh, maybe the advice or the counsel or if they're not seeking mm. it. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. What do you wish that more people knew that are in those roles, the, the impact that they have on the people that they're, that they're actually uh, fortunate enough to serve? What do I wish they knew? All right, let me think about that for a second. So the, the, the heart, like I think that everybody, I'm not sure if it's just men or not. It, it, might, it might be universal, but I think that most of us want friendship, accountability, opportunity, love, appreciation, honor, like those are the things that we're striving for. Mm -hmm. And in my own life, what I've found is when I'm friendlier, when I'm more honorable, when I'm more loving, when I'm more appreciative, then I tend to experiencing, uh, experience those things in my day-to-day -day life. And so, you know, if I was whispering counsel into somebody's ear, by the way, who asked, you know, the last thing that you or I or anybody else <laughs> wants is unsolicited uh, coaching or mentoring advice, right? Yes, if somebody yes. goes, this thing isn't working for me and, and, and I need some help, what do you see? And then that's where, like I said, I don't give advice, I give options. Here's an option. What if you gave this a shot? Test it, see if it works. Whether it's friendly, in this example, friendliness or honor, you know, being honorable or loving or whatever it is for you. You know, that's what, that's what I would say if nudged for a, a piece or a slice of counsel. Well, with the humility that you have, with the disposition that you have, with the openness that you have, Jay, what is something that you've never told anybody? Never, never. Nobody on the planet knows. Oh, geez. Let me think. I haven't even whispered it to my closest friend or my maker. Nobody. I mean, you can, you can decide that. Wow. I'm really getting introspective here. Nobody knows. Can I go with very few people now? Okay. There we go. So in 1995, I don't know, what does that put me in my late 20s? Um, I had a girlfriend at the time, and I was driving a 1990, let's see, 92, maybe 95, I don't know, somewhere in that window, Corvette. I had, I had, I had this thing by my 30th birthday, I need to own my first house and I need to own a Corvette. I don't yes. know why it was a Corvette, Sam Malone. but it had to be a Corvette. Sam Malone from Cheers. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. So it was, so it was emerald green with the target top, the whole deal. Right. So, so one night uh, we decide to go downtown. This is in Northern California. There used to be a, a development in the center of San Jose called San Jose Live. And it was a, uh, a nightclub, you know, it was playing all the beats and DJs and, you know, it was just crawl. It was packed back in the day. Right. And, um, we went there and we had a little to drink and she asked me if I was okay to drive. And I said, yeah, yeah piece of cake, no problem. And we started heading home from, uh, San Jose live. And I still remember the road that we would take to get to um, my condo like i said first house and first corvette <laughs> by the time i was 30. uh so we're on our way back there and i see these um construction lines flashing and everything narrowing down into one lane right and i'm like construction at 2 15 that seems weird oh. and i'm watching cars kind of pull off to the left and to the right and do u-turns and turning around and i'm like the line of cars isn't that long. 
I'll be through it in a couple of minutes. I'll be home in 10, no problem. So I stayed in the lane, right? Well, as it turns out, those sneaky California Highway Patrol officers, who, by the way, we love, thank you for your service, service. and protection, yes. they had set a little trap for knuckleheads like me, and it wasn't a construction zone, but it was a DUI checkpoint. Mm. So as I approached the now obviously officer peering into the window and not a guy in a yellow hard hat, he said, sir, have you been drinking? And I said, I had a couple of beers. And he said, why don't you pull over to the right? And you know the routine. Please exit the vehicle. Please walk this line. Please count backwards and, you know, do this. I don't even know if I could do it. I can't sober. even do it sober. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's, they don't tell you that nobody can do it sober. They're just like, <laughs> that's the, re- okay. like the so, Like the ABC is backwards. I don't think anyone could do that. Yeah, right. A Z, Y, X. Okay, I can get started. I can okay, get started. So, so, so then he says those, you can count the words, put your hands behind your back. <sighs> yeah, oh, right. So I was lovingly escorted to, um, I think the official term is a paddy wagon. Is that what they call those things? Yes. Where you're, they're going to take you to the pokey yeah. um, uh, with, with a few of my not closest friends, by the way, in the, in the back <laughs> of this um, paddy wagon. Did you have a silk shirt on in that Corvette too? Oh my gosh, you would not believe what I was wearing. Um, I, I can't. I was, wearing, I was wearing this leather San Jose Sharks jacket. Now remember, I'm in the Bay Area, so I'm a fan. <laughs> And this jacket was like, like the you know, puffy it, was half, it was half, no, 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 it was like uh, more of an aviator style, but it was half black and half white. And it had the shark's emblem on the back. And this thing was pimp. The collar pulled up, you know, the whole deal. <laughs> so, so that's what I was wearing. That's a whole separate story once I got to the cell. But so I'm wearing that. I'm in the back of this thing and I am going to jail. Now, for those of you that have never spent a night in jail, let me, this is one of those, uh, like the biblical story where you can learn what to do and not to do. And in my book, I say, um, if your story ever ends up in a book, make sure that it's a lesson and not something otherwise, like a warning, you know, this is the warning. Okay. Don't do it. So, yeah. So I got to spend the night in jail, um, with some, again, not some of my closest friends. And for some reason, the officers in that jail were really interested in seeing how uh, Lily White Boy, leather jacket wearing, pointy shoes, uh, Alfani uh, was going to fare inside the the pokey, right? And so uh, I'm not going to say they were instigating things, but when one of the guys said, let's see what these two dogs do, I think think that qualifies as instigating, right? And so, uh, yeah, so I spent that night in jail. And... There's very few people on the planet that know that, but there's one thing, one thing that nobody knows. I've never told anybody. You're the only one who's ever going to hear it. When I got pulled over, I pissed my pants, a puddle, <laughs> like literally, I don't know if I was holding the six beers that entire time, but I literally, you let go. You just the whole go. deal. This is, just bam. Lots of all bladder control. Gone. Just bam. Oh, just I, peed your pants. And I, I sat there in a puddle of my own. Oh, man. Could you get me lower than that? So and there you, you go. You went to jail in some pee pee pants. Oh, my gosh. Can you imagine? I was the hit of the party. But that yeah. must have been good because if you're, if you're, you got, you peed in your pants, then people are going to kind of stay away from you a little bit. You know hey, what I'm saying? Maybe somebody was looking out for me and I just didn't there we find go. the blood. That's that, that's that blessing that, that God brought to you, Jay. That, yeah. that is awesome. That is amazing. <clears throat> the whole reason why I started the podcast, Jay, was because my kids, uh, Maddox and McKenna. Uh, Maddox is yeah. uh, 10 years old. You've met him. He's run through uh, before. He's a little cartoon character. Um, and yeah. then McKenna, who yesterday I messed up with. I made a, a, a horrible um, 
you know, I, I held her accountable to things that were in my brain as opposed to what she's living. Mm. And I've asked yeah. this podcast, actually, I have to go home as dad and I have to apologize. This sucks, but I got to do it. Yeah. Especially after listening to you and being a good example in my life. I wish you would have been a bad example today. And then I would have been like, I can blame her. And I'm, now I got to live in the blame and the shame. And what's the other one? The, nope. Uh, nope. No justification. No, no shame. Just, no blame. So justification, line, blame, shame. I got to live above the line is what it is. Yep. So I started yep. the podcast because of those two. And I wanted to take iconic figures like yourself. And I wanted mm. to, for lack of a better word, I wanted to humanize them to my kids. I wanted them to see that the J Shoops of the world um, that, that coach many people to high levels of success, plus that you accomplish it on your own, in your own right, and, and you help people to do it, that you're not an icon, that you're not an idol, that you are a human being that makes mistakes and that has a phenomenal attitude and crazy work ethic. So what advice do you have for Maddox and McKenna? And if you could use both of their names, it would be awesome. Yes. Well, let me say this, Maddox and McKenna. I'm going to share with you an idea that I gave my daughter and she ultimately wrote it into a contract, a contract between her and me. She made the choice. I didn't say we're making a contract. She made the choice. Now, I should say that, you know, this was when she was uh, five or six, maybe. And so the validity of that contract or whether she had the ability legally to enter into a contract is probably up for debate. And my attorney friends might say it's voidable or void. I'm just going to say she took the initiative and made this contract with me. And it was really simple. I said, love your mom. That's the first thing. Love your mom. And never say to either of us, I hate you. I never want to hear those words. Because I've seen teenagers or kids. I remember once I was getting fitted for a tuxedo for a friend's wedding. And there was this unruly kid and the mom was just struggling with this kid. And he's like, I hate you. And although she didn't let anybody know, I mean, that thing, that stung, right? You and I both know, you know, principally that uh, life and death are in the tongue, right? Well, those words were speaking death, right? She died a little bit in that moment. So I thought, I never want to hear those words out of my daughter's mouth. So Maddox, McKenna, I, I know you're, you're way smarter than this. But the lesson is, if there's something that's a non-negotiable for you, have a conversation about it. If you want to put it into a contract where you can hold each other accountable in the event that it occurs, then so be it. But let me tell you, I've never heard those words. Her mother has never heard those words out of her mouth. Mm. And there's been some seasons. I said she hasn't gone off the rails. That doesn't mean she didn't need to be corrected and disciplined. But those words have never come out of her mouth. And I would encourage you, if you're in any relationship, to decide what's a non-negotiable for you and talk about it. And, you know, if it's a marriage, you know, some people would call that a contract, right? If it's a friendship, that bond is like a contract. These are things that I'm, I'm not going to say to you. And I have a heart for people that are um, suffering from any form of abuse, whether it's physical or verbal. Like in my case, I, I took on a lot of water for a lot of years in the form of abuse. Um, so I get it. Words matter. So just remember, words matter. Choose them wisely. That's, that's what I would say to Maddox and McKenna. Choose wisely. Jay, you have been absolutely phenomenal. Single ladies out there, all the single ladies that are Christian, um, single Christian women, um, they're going to be lighting up the, uh, <laughs> they're going to be lighting up the podcast. They're going to be sharing it with their friends. <laughs> Uh, you know, if you're watching, I want to thank every single one of you that's, uh, that's watching. I want to thank all our sponsors. Uh, I want to thank everybody who's listened over the uh, past two years. Um, you have helped us, uh, you, all of you listening, have helped us to get into the one per, top 1% 1 globally and of all podcasts, which is, I mean, it, it's, it's so humbling to hear that part because that's not what we were focused on. Mm -hmm. We were focused on mm -hmm. bringing you things that would help in your life and, and, and they were the right things for the right reasons. And that's why I think the right things are happening. Um, but also too, yeah. with all the sponsors that have stuck with us from the very beginning, uh, I want to thank you and Jay, like you have been unbelievable today. It has been so much fun thank you. to be able to thank spend you. this time. And I, I want to have you on again. Um, I'd love to have you on for another episode. 
Oh. Have your people call my people. Yes, I will. I definitely do that. Man. <laughs> okay. Just... Now, now you, I'm being facetious. You know, I don't have people, right? Yes. There's only me. Yeah. Oh, well, he's the, he's the man. He's, he's a very humble guy. Um, but that's the reason why I think that, uh, that you're so approachable and that you're so effective at what it is that you do, Jay. Um, and I want to thank you for that, man. And, uh, again, like now's the time where you click the links, you check all the sponsors, do it, you know, you need to do. And, uh, Jay Shoop, uh, coach Shoop, Jay Shoop, dad, all those titles that you have, the FB VP, um, all those titles, um, you live up to them and you are such an incredible example to all of us, man. And I want to thank you for that. Thank you. You're officially off the hot seat. Oh, <laughs>